we have uh, next the data availability uh, data availability committee panel. Uh, we have Evan Forbes, uh, core dev at Celestia, uh, Anurag Arjun, uh, co-founder at Avail. Uh, we have Sriram Kanan, uh, CEO at Eigenlayer, as well as Terence Sao, core dev at Optane Labs. Terence, take it away, sir. All right, thank you. So yeah, so I guess Hunter already did a nice intro. We probably don't need to introduce ourselves again. Um, yeah, sounds good. So yeah, so let's get this party started, right? So um, I'm Terrence, I'm one of the core dev. Ironically, I work on EIP 4844, so which is another DA solution. So yeah, I'm very happy and honored to be part of this panel. So first question, let's talk about trade-off. I think that's the first thing when I think of data availability solution is trade off, right? So the cap theorem back in late 90s stated that basically a distributed system, you cannot simultaneously have consistency, availability, and then partition, right? And then, and then fast forward like 10 years later, the blockchain scalability trilemma, I think was coined by Vitalik, saying that there is a trade off between decentralization, security, and scalability. And at most, you can have two of those three, right? And then Ethereum kind of operate on the safer side. So in the context of data availability solution, DA, is there a trading model there? Is, it, is, is there a trade-off there? And uh, I'm happy to hear you, you guys' in, input on this. So I'm not sure about ordering. Like, I guess whoever wants to go first can go first, or we can also go by first name, by, by alphabet, kind, 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 kind of like a fair or or kind of like kind of like a fair order or hearing style what, what do you guys think i'm gonna i'm gonna ask for a time boost terence <laughs> <laughs> yeah so whoever wants to go first can go first okay i'll i'll go um you know the trilemma basically says that uh, you cannot get you know security scalability and decentralization simultaneously and it kind of came from this idea that if you want to do sharding, right, you, you have to basically take validators, divide them into smaller groups, and then each small group executes each of these things separately. The smaller the group, the more the scaling, because your redundancy goes down. But the, the smaller the group, the more the scaling, but the worse the security. So this was the kind of basis of the trilemma. I think what happened in the Ethereum roadmap is actually something really interesting, which is a way to avoid the trilemma completely by separating this into two parts. One part being the roll-up uh, landscape where you basically offload the computation and then use cryptographic proofs to prove to the base layer that you've done things correctly. And so the computation is scaled. And then what remains is the data publication or data availability where the inputs or outputs of these rollups need to be published in a common place. It turns out that in the context of data availability, we know actually there is no trilemma. You can actually scale and be secure and be decentralized simultaneously. And how do we think about this? From, in, from the eigenlayer perspective, the way we think about it is, Imagine there are n nodes. Each of the n nodes has a small amount of bandwidth each. And now can I create a data availability system where the total data availability rate increases linearly as in the number of nodes while, so you're getting scaling, you're getting decentralization because each node has only a little bit. You're also getting security because you're saying that as long as the majority of these nodes are honest, you will be able to um, run this system correctly. So uh, uh, the idea of uh, you know, erasure codes basically means we can actually create uh, a data availability system which doesn't have the trilemma at all. Yeah. I can um, yeah, or Anurag, okay. you want to go? <laughs> yeah, no, nothing. I don't have uh, like too much to add on that. Like, I'm mean, Susan already laid out the point regarding, uh, you know, like uh, because this is now being um, 
blockchain constructs are becoming you know like uh, modular uh, as we speak right like i mean so what is happening is uh, these these layers are becoming more and more specialized so like something like away or celestia or you know like uh, basically uh, sep- operate this separate network with uh, their own set of validators for example um, um and in general because of this combination of village coding and whatever commitment scheme you use uh, we use kzg for normal commitment so i mean essentially this property of village coding allows us to you know kind of uh, also allow for you know like things like data resampling which just makes it easy to verify right like so so we can increase blocks and so we don't really have that big blocks problem that let's say monolithic blockchains really have um um and you can just verify them also pretty efficiently so maybe the um uh, that was uh, the scalability trilemma or so um was coined in in a very uh, in a, in a sense where everything was coupled together it's not uh, it's not same when you know like we have moved to a more uh, roll up uh, like execution going off chain and so on right like i mean um yeah yeah ivan sorry i interjected oh no it's totally fine yeah i i don't have too much more to add besides i don't think that there is a trilemma really especially for data availability and especially from like an engineering point of view like if we're just talking about like practicality it's like we have plenty of scale right now so we don't really need to really like like get become that much more efficient or that much contain like that many more that much like bigger blocks like on ethereum currently yes of course we do but if you look at like the capacity of other data availability layers right now like uh we can comfortably hit 8 megabytes or even higher without even doing anything fancy like that's plenty of block data for the time being and um i don't know i'm i'm an engineer so sometimes when i when when I see some like theoretical arguments and just sort of like mm, well in the future <laughs> like like sort of thinking about these things it, it is it's definitely good about thank you for that yeah um great answers i guess my follow up question is then how critical is decentralization in your solution because like coming from layer 1 or coming from the bitcoin space we want maximum decentralization right but then for the for, from the layer 2 perspective maybe not because we only have this like o of one trust model in some cases i guess for optimistic world per se and then now looking at the da solution right uh, does that mean that having more nodes are contributing to the proportional of the security like how do we balance between security and decentralization here and the and, and the and the and the what is the optimal equilibrium can we define decentralization before it <laughs> i would say it's the number of nodes the, the basically the number of the watchers in the network yeah what what do you mean, also, what do you mean by watchers like like the like the ability to verify the chain like the the sure. the number yeah. of people verifying the chain so yeah. are we counting like a light node verifying the chain here yes we can Ah okay so the number of light nodes yeah yeah definitely um then then i think at least for i mean i can i think i can speak for at least the solutions that um rely on light nodes and focus on light nodes so this is like something that is an off chain solution so or not off chain that's not the correct word but something like avail or celestia where we're focused for light node security so if you're able to run a light node and you're doing data availability sampling then you can convince yourself that the data is actually available along with some other guarantees like around error share encoding and um, you have to wait for like a qualification fraud proofs some things like this um but yeah like like the number of light nodes is incredibly important you can't actually increase the the block size without having enough light clients because if you don't have enough light clients if you don't have enough people sampling then you can't actually reconstruct the block so then like sampling is kind of pointless because it's really trivial to actually just convince you that the that your samples are valid but if you can't reconstruct the block then in the worst case scenario then the data is effectively hidden or at least some data could be effectively hidden
Um, I so I mean, um, I think I'll just take a slightly different, uh, um, like not go on the light node path uh, because that's that's what Ivan already spoke about. But essentially, like I mean, um, see when we look at Ethereum as a data availability layer, right? Like I mean, um, um, I mean we need to ask the same questions, you know, like uh, same thing, right? Like I mean, there's this tremendous amount of crypto economic security that Ethereum has, and that's why rollups rely on. You know, like ordering guarantees of Ethereum uh, in the first place, right? Like, uh, so certainly, uh, light node verification uh, yeah, makes sense in in systems like let's say like Avail and Celestia. Uh, but uh, but really, there is the crypto economic guarantee of a base layer that also, I mean, uh, accounts for uh, the uh, let's say the initial ordering, for example, right? Like, so so same kind of principles also apply to other systems, uh, including all of us on the panel, right? Like, I mean, you need to have like um, you know, like a certain amount of crypto economic security for in, uh, initial finalization. Of course, you can have, um, you know, like uh, this additional property of light, line, uh, light node verification or light line verification that, you know, like build upon that so that, you know, like we can increase block size and so on and so forth. But uh, from, uh, from a base layer perspective, in that sense, if you think Ethereum should be decentralized, so certainly DLS should, uh, you know, like also strive for that. Is is what our opinion and avail is. Yeah, um, I can tell you some some of how we think about this design. Eigen DA is designed from first principle as an adjacent to the Ethereum blockchain. It's adjacent to the Ethereum blockchain. There is an existing blockchain. I just want to increase the data availability throughput. That's the starting point. It's a very different starting point from how do I build a, a blockchain which has ordering and data availability, very different. And because of this, we prioritize and do different things. Okay, um, here is a fact. From the viewpoint of an Ethereum rollup, right? Because that's all that I care about, Ethereum rollups because we are simply an adjacent to the Ethereum blockchain. From the point of view of an Ethereum rollup, the rollup contract makes progress based on the testimony of the validators. It cannot do any data availability sampling. Data availability sampling adds nothing to the Ethereum rollup security. Okay. I'm an Ethereum rollup. The rollup contract makes progress based on the testimony of the validators that the data is available and it cannot go further and do anything to actually evaluate using sampling or otherwise even if you're a roll-up client and you evaluate that data is not available how do you communicate that to the roll-up contract what are you going to do about it so from the point of view of ethereum anything else is simply a committee now you can ask, what is the properties of the committee that we are able to see from the viewpoint of Ethereum? If you're a natively Celestia rollup or a natively Avail rollup, then the properties that you get are fundamentally very strong when you do data availability sampling. Because even if the validators lie to you, okay, you can say, oh yeah, the validators are lying. I sampled the data, I couldn't find it. So the data is you know, not available. So I'm not going to accept a block, even if a majority of the validators say that this is the block. You can do that. So there is a superpower to data availability sampling, but that power is only experienced if you are a native rollup of where the ordering system and the availability system are tied together, which is how Celestia and Avail are actually built. But from the point of view of Ethereum, it's just seeing, hey, somebody said something. That's all that it can see. Okay, number one. Now, you know, given that this is the starting point, you can ask, like, how do you build a data availability system which is simply adjacent, which is just simply like a like a coprocessor is just like a co data availability layer. It is not a fundamentally separate chain. It doesn't have an existence of its own. How do you build this, and how do you build you know, this to have a certain notion of security. So the first thing that we do is actually say that what is the, so there are really two things that happens in this committee. This committee stores the data 
and then serves the data. These are the two things that you're doing. It has to store because it's a data availability layer. It has to store the data. It has to also serve the data. These are the two things. So what we do is actually rely fundamentally on the ideas in the Ethereum landscape. And how do you know that roll up these EigenDA nodes are storing the data? We use a, a mechanism called proof of custody. Proof of custody is basically, you know, compute some kind of a function of all the data that you are storing and a secret that only you know, and you have to report it in some way. And when you compute this function, if, if you're not storing the data, you will never be able to compute that function correctly and you will be slashed. Your ETH will be slashed. So that's the first part. How do we know that these nodes are actually storing the data? We use a mechanism called proof of custody. This is Dankrad and uh, Justin Drake developed this mechanism. We just use it. So that's proof of custody, which basically ensures that people are storing data. But then how do you ensure that these nodes serve the data? Okay, I'm coming to your question on decentralization, just setting up the requirements so that decentralization arises as a consequence or not. And we can see that. So the, there's another problem. What if all the validators store the data and like pass the custody proofs, but they never serve it to anybody. Service is not provable on chain. And this is a kind of a fundamental problem. So Eigenlayer gives economic security two things that are provable on chain. Proof of custody is provable on chain. Therefore, Eigenlayer can give economic security to that. But service is not provable on chain. So we are stuck in a little bit of a dilemma here. How do we solve this? And people think, oh, no, EigenDA therefore doesn't have any economic security or doesn't have any security. That's not correct. I'll explain what the security model of EigenDA is. So now what we do is we say, okay, now these guys have stored the data. I know that they've stored the data because otherwise they'll get slashed. And the data has been well dispersed because in EigenDA, you can control the erasure coding parameter. You can say that, you know, I can retrieve the data from any, you know, 20% of the nodes or any 10% of the nodes by controlling the erasure code. Each rollup can choose this erasure coding ratio. Now what happens is the data is stored. It does it get served. What we do is we have a fee model where each DA node can have a local retrieval fee market where you say, you know, how much do I need to pay? for downloading the data. Each of them set a fee. Now, if all of these guys collude together, if all these nodes collude together, they can basically say like, I'm not serving anybody because I'm doing an attack and we're out. So to prevent this, what we do is we want to get decentralization, which is one of the fundamental pillars of blockchain, right? It's not just economics. It's not just the rich putting up some money. It's, decentralization is a very important property. So what we, what we say is in EigenDA, if there are enough distinct parties, which are non-colluding, you know, if everybody colludes, then it doesn't work. So you want enough distinct parties, which are non-colluding, which is a property that comes from decentralization. Then what happens is since the data is well dispersed, there is a competition to serve. Because if you don't serve, somebody else is going to serve. They're going to reduce the price more. So everybody's price to serve comes down in equilibrium to the cost to serve. This is the EigenDA security model. It is a complex combination of economic security and decentralization-based security. And because decentralization is a fundamental requirement in EigenDA, we have to design the system to have very low node requirements, consensus node requirements, not sampling node requirements. Because consensus nodes, if I say that they require one GBPS, how can I get a large number of decentralized nodes? If I say I require 100 GBPS, how can I get a large number of decentralized nodes? So we have to actually take a very, very careful approach where the node requirement has to be very, very low. Our node requirement is like less than, you know, a few megabits per second. Okay, so that's the EigenDA principle is because we, we get economic security from each staking, we get decentralization from the Ethereum node operator set. The only way you're going to get a decentralized node operator set is the node requirements become small. That's how EigenDA works. And that's the security model. That's the role of decentralization in our system. Can I, can I, I, would, I would like to um, add a, at least a small counterpoint 
earlier in, in one of Shriram's definitions, or, or he said he said the word uh, nothing, data availability sampling provides nothing to the security of data availability for what he's right. So for a smart contract, you can't prove that data availability sampling works at all without uploading the entire data back to the chain, which defeats the purpose, right? However, however, data availability sampling is a critical component of detecting when data is not available. And when you have an off-chain solution, such as Avail or Celestia, you can hard fork and you can socially slash validators when they hide data. So data availability sampling, if I run a light node and I'm running a rollup, it doesn't prevent the validators from attacking me. So to that extent, it's 100% true. However, there is some slashing that can occur socially when this does occur. So there's like one minor point, but, but the, the, the I, I, point I, I that agree. you made yeah, is completely true. The utility is not fundamentally coming due to sampling, though. It's coming due to the presence of a native asset. Okay, so here's the difference. Imagine I run another chain which doesn't have data availability sampling. For example, NIR is working with us in providing DA to the Ethereum ecosystem. NIR is a chain, and NIR has a native asset called the NIR token. And if the NIR validators lie to Ethereum, then the near chain can fork, even though near doesn't have data availability sampling, because it's plenty obvious to anybody who bothers to go and try to access the near chain that the chain block number 31 is not available and no block after that is available. Go to the RPC, it doesn't work. Then you're like, oh my God, you know, the RPC doesn't give me the data. Now I need to do something. You download a full node and then see, and then you're unable to download it. So this, use case is not centered around the data availability sampling. It is centered around a native asset. I agree that that's the case. Very but true. native assets Very can true. be created either by creating a new chain or creating even your own ERC-20 token, which can be forked. ERC-20 tokens can also be forked. So, you know, in our, the Eigen DA worldview is that each rollup can create its own native asset and you can stake that along with ETH. If you don't have a native asset, somebody else can provide an asset which is staked and you can use it. So, and, and the, the simple idea here is that even if you use a ERC-20 token to stake, you know, let's say there's a token called the data token and then you stake it. And if the data token holders all lie and the data is not available, it's transparent to everybody else who's watching who cares to watch, just like, you know, if you want a cat to watch a chain, anybody who cares to watch, it's obvious that the data is not available. So they're going to say like, oh, these guys take the token and they didn't provide the data. So people can socially say that like those token holders should be slashed. You create a new version of the ERC-20 token and then you can follow it. So the, but it is crucial that the community has the ability to fork the value not fork a chain, but fork the value. And that's what induces a crypto economic penalty. So th there is just a lot of nuance that gets lost in these conversations. So I'm trying to kind of break it up into the different pieces. Again, I want to reiterate that data availability sampling is a super powerful thing for natively integrated rollups. But for a rollup which is living in a different universe, Unfortunately, we have not found any ways to translate these superpowers into another chain. Thank you. No, that one makes thing, sense. Go ahead, sorry. We didn't do sampling. And one more thing is when a system has erasure coded block commitments, you can out of protocol build data availability sampling. It doesn't need to be in protocol. So one of the ways when you design a complex system, for example, when you're designing Ethereum, it's important to design the Ethereum parameters correctly, whatever needs to be in protocol. But anybody can build a wallet for Ethereum. It's out of protocol. The, any system that has erasure coded commitments lends itself to data availability sampling. So this is why we didn't prioritize for two reasons. One is we are purely adjacent to Ethereum. So we, we, don't, we haven't figured out a way to use the power of data availability sampling on an Ethereum smart contract. Number two, it can be built out of protocol to the number of users who want to use it as a sovereign rollup or something, they can sample and use it. 
Yeah, quickly just to <clears throat> add a point. Right? I mean, yeah, Sriram is correct in the sense that we need to treat uh, Ethereum rollups and you know, like Avail native or Celestia native rollups separately. Uh, but uh, even in that context, from a you know, like a Ethereum, like a construction, um, you know, like a hybrid construction, as a Validium or an Optimium, for example, which let's say puts data on you know, like let's say Avail or any other D layer. Um, uh, even then, yes, certainly, uh, you know, like it's basically uh, for from the Ethereum point of view, it's like a, let's say, um, a committee assertion or a two by three uh, assertion that that we can send, right? Like, I mean, that's why, you know, like we've built a bridge uh, from Avail to Ethereum uh, that basically attests to the fact that, you know, like two by three of the validator set on Avail has attested to, you know, like... Uh, so that's certainly i mean uh, so i agree in that sense and so from that viewpoint um like decentralization in the sense that you know like even even from that viewpoint right like the number of validators uh, the uh, amount of uh, uh, or the number of participants that can collude to corrupt the um, uh, chain in itself uh, that is an important uh, uh, criterion uh, and, and i just want to state uh, our design choices in the sense that you know like uh, that's why we opted for um the substrate uh, framework from polkadot and we use like grandpa babe and consensus uh, um, you know like in general which you know like uh, is is like this hybrid ledger construction uh, uh, that can you know like uh, have up to a thousand validators for now and with the addition of bls uh, in scheme, you know, we can go beyond 10k uh, or more uh, in the future, right? Like so, so I mean, just pointing out that this is this is a design consideration that we had in mind when we, you know, can start of building out and just to make that uh, uh, implicit, explicit. Very nice. Yeah, I feel like we could go on this forever because this is such an interesting and fascinating conversation. But unfortunately, like I think we only have like five minutes le left, so I'm gonna just like throw in like my one of my last question is that how do you how like how do you envision the evolution of the data availability landscape play out in the next two years and say in the next 10 years like what is the ultimate end game here um see um from our angle how we view this is that you know like um uh, in general, uh, there's a lot of design space around rollups in general, right? Like, I mean, right now, the rollups that we are seeing are more EVM centric. Uh, um, I mean, some we have some like Starkware, for example, which is doing a different execution environment, but we are now seeing a lot of, um, uh, you know, like different execution environments coming up, right? Like, I mean, there's Sovereign Labs that is doing like a RIS0 uh, rollup based on RIS0. There are, you know, like Wasm. Uh, based environments and such, right? Like so, and different teams are working with different sort of uh, roll-up constructions, like where the st storage uh, structure is optimized, or you know, like maybe for application chains or for parallelization. Like there's a bunch of trade-offs uh, that they're making, and so with that, we see that you know, like uh, up till now, you know, it's been like maybe five or ten serious roll-ups. But uh, what we believe is that uh, that number of rollups will, uh, you know, like increase very exponentially, uh, you know, like because you now have, we are seeing uh, this evolution of like what we what people call micro rollups, which are like very lightweight sort of rollup constructions. And so, you know, like you you'll and we fully believe that there will be like thousands of you know, like, or maybe, you know, like millions, I don't want to take that lightly, but uh, number lightly, but, you know, I mean, there will be a lot of this, right? Like, and so, um, like, how all this will work together? How can we as a, a base um, you know, day layer, you know, like handle all this, you know, like how communication will happen between all this, right? Like, I mean, I think that's, that's really, you know, like something that we are really, uh, really looking forward to. As far as DA goes for the next two years, I am super excited besides just big blocks. Like I think we all have like, depending on our systems, we have very like good ways of scaling to get to huge blocks, like ungodly um, sized blocks. However, the really cool things 
is that I think we can we can do this so we can provide ordering guarantees very quickly. So meaning that you can sort of like separate sampling from the actual block. So currently what we do is we have like a block and we have a square and those are the same thing. However, you can have a lot of blocks and you combine them into one large square. So then you're actually only sample like once a minute, but you produce blocks as fast as you possibly can. And this allows for rollups, bridging between rollups to occur extremely fast. And that's one thing. And then another thing that I'm also very excited about is um, for certain data availability layers that don't have execution environments, we can, um, it's, it's actually easier for us to break the proposer monopoly. So this has critical uh, roles in MEV and I don't want to get too, too deep in the weeds now because we don't have time, but those are just two things that I'm very excited about that are just besides having these huge blocks. Um, my, uh, our view on this is, uh, the more the data availability bandwidth that exists, the, the, so there are a few dimensions that you want to optimize for the, you want to have more data availability bandwidth. You want to have low cost per bit because, you know, one of the things that, you know, a lot, a lot of us here are like super bullish on what we should do inside the crypto space. And so what that means is if you want to bring a lot of applications and digital platforms that are native in cloud today into the crypto space, you have to have, you know, break the cost barrier, the cost of like, you know, doing it in a decentralized system should be pretty close to doing it in a centralized system. Otherwise people are not going to pay the premium to actually come and, and build inside the blockchain space. So the cost per bit needs to go down and then the latency needs to go down, you know, even alluded to that, you know, methods to do that. And then the flexibility of what type of systems you can build, you know, need to go up. So, you know, I think all of us collectively here are working on several of these things. So super exciting to see how we take it forward. Well, thank you. So I think that concludes our wonderful panel. So thank you guys for joining. You guys are all my inspiration in this space and thank you for doing everything that you guys are doing and thank you for pushing this space forward. So yeah, thank you.